Hi. Uh, for you, those who have not met me before, uh, I'm Hilda. I live here in Oslo and I studied theater dramaturgy and did my master's on uh, how you can switch between different levels uh, of um, uh, between fiction and reality while you are role playing. So uh, that's the perspective I will bring into this uh, talk as well. Um, and this title is a bit of a trick title because actually in any LARP you have to change perspective on the world. It's kind of how it works. You have to see uh, your surroundings in a different way. You have to maybe pretend that a mansion uh, or a regular house is actually a castle. You might pretend that a tape on the floor is a wall. Um, and that a rubber sword uh, is actually really dangerous. And you also have to take that perspective on, on others. You have to pretend that they are somebody else and also that you are maybe somebody else. And when it comes to all art, this is actually uh, part of what art is in some definitions, that uh, it, um, it depends on how you look at things and how you interpret them. So. Uh, if you look at one thing as a regular object, you will interpret it differently than if you look at it as art. Um, but <laughs> uh, most, uh, <coughs> most art forms exist even if we don't really think that they are art or not. But when it comes to LARP and theater and other things that use real bodies and real material, we really have to see them as art for them to exist at all. Um, because uh, if we don't, if you don't look at me as my character, there's no lock between us. Yeah. Um, and I came into this just a quick background. I came into this uh, because uh, I got so curious about the connection between the theater theorist Bertolt Brecht, uh, who experimented in the 1930s uh, and so forth. Uh, on how to uh, break uh, the audience's immersion into the play so that they could instead question what was going on. Instead of just accepting that, oh, this is how things go, uh, they could uh, start to question, like, why did it go this way? Maybe we could have done something differently. And his aesthetics were quite directly copied into our black box LARPs through the movie Dogville. Uh, and we didn't only steal his aesthetics, but we also stole some of his methods to play around with what we can call the meta levels of role playing. Uh, and this is what you can see, for example, in one of the early black box LARPs, When Our Destinies Meet. Um, the first quote is about the Brechtian theater, what he is trying to achieve uh, with breaking up uh, the fiction in different ways. And the second quote uh, is from the LARP When Our Destinies Meet, that directly quotes Brecht as their inspiration. One of the few LARPs that does that, even though everyone looks a <coughs> bit like Dogville. Um, when we look at those minimalistic black box LARPs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I got really curious about what are these levels that we play with and how does it really work? Um, um, May, we have quite a lot of theories now on immersion and what that could be, uh, different ways of describing that. But we don't really describe the other levels of role playing. Um, mostly people just point out that, of course, you have a double vision and you know that uh, you are a player and you know that you are a character at the same time. But how? <laughs> and how can we play with that? Um, and one of the keys to my understanding of this was when I came across like the most common understanding of immersion is that it's kind of a flow state, um, uh, mostly based on Sarah Lynn Bowman's uh, works. But uh, what opened it up for me was to look <coughs> at immersion as an interpretive framework, which some other researchers do. Uh, and I decided to call this uh, the fiction of the role play as a fictional frame that you then can immerse in. Um, and that we can put on different interpretive frames to look at the world around us. This is where the psychology comes in, <laughs> bear with me. Uh, it's called conceptual integration, and I will unpack this for you, <laughs> don't worry. Um, this is from a wonderful little book called Theatre and Mind. Um, 
and uh, McConaughey uh, talks about that what it makes it possible for all to play and role play is that we have the ability of abstract thinking. Because it's our ability of abstract thinking that allows us to have different concepts in our mind at the same time and compare them. So this is how we can enter one world and at the same time see another. Um, so we have one interpretive frame of reality, uh, how we understand things. If you run towards me with a knife that I think is a real knife, I would react accordingly. And then we have an, uh, another frame of fiction where we understand things in another way. So these are different logic systems and that, that we can keep them in mind at the same time and compare them is what is called conceptual integration. Yes. Um, so actually when we are role playing, we don't only change perspectives so much as that we take on an additional one. And then we blend them, uh, is the term McConaughey uses. Um, yeah. So since we go into this perspective willingly, we take that and put it onto reality, uh, we can unblend when we want and blend when we want. So we can go in and out of the fiction in our mind when we want, um, because the reality is always behind it in a way. <coughs> um, we can do that at a the theater too, and just look at the actors for a while and think, oh, that's a really good actor, uh, and then go back into the fiction of the story. Um, but usually we try to stay in the flow because we enjoy being immersed in fiction. Um, so, like, the idea of total immersion is kind of a myth um, regarding, like, if you look through this series, but um, what we call a successful immersion is rather um, when you can uh, have a successful blend between reality and fiction so that reality doesn't bother us. Um, yeah, I was a bit quick here, but you can also say that you uh, try to focus so much you ca as you can on the fiction, like a follow spot that you can uh, focus in on the story that you want to see, and you know that reality is just in the corner of your eye, but you try not to look too much at it. Um, and it's something else than just forgetting about it, it's about focus. And this is also why we ask people to not be too unattentive to each other. You're, you're expected to be able to take care of the other players, even though you're really into the story. So, um, yeah, we will look at this now uh, in a model that would make it a bit more clear. Um, so we have the interpretive frame of reality, uh, where we live. Uh, and this is individual. So everyone will have their own interpretive frame of reality based on their life experience. Uh, and into that, we put an interpretive frame of fiction and how we see the world in this story. Um, but we could just zoom in and try to focus on the fiction, but we can also zoom out. And that is what I call the meta-reflective state. Uh, we go out into meta-reflection and then we use that conceptual integration that I was talking about to compare the two. Uh, and this can be done in any LARP at any time, because if we have the ability to role play, we also have the ability to switch between these modes. Yes. Mm, yeah, I chose the word meta-reflection because it also means the um, consideration of various different points of view, which fits quite, quite well with what I'm trying to explain. Um, so, um, when you are playing a LARP and you get some kind of insight about it, uh, you are drawing a conclusion between two systems of the fiction and the real world. So uh, you put uh, something in the fiction, a character, fictional world, actions or game structure, in relation to something in the real world. Be it uh, a narrative that you recognize, something personal in you, political or social issues. Um, this model uh, makes some design choices and some rooms that you can go into when you LARP more clear to me, at least. Um, like, if you have a thought while you're playing that is purely off game, uh, it's not a meta reflection. Like, uh, when does my parking ticket run out? Maybe I have to sneak out. 
or if it's only in game, it's not a uh, meta reflection either. Um, then, you, like, can I? How can I see the throne? Uh, it's just taking place within the LARP, right? But if you're thinking, oh, look at this game structure. This is fascism. That sucks. Then, uh, then that is one. Uh, that could be a meta reflection when you draw that kind of conclusion. Um, or if you uh, think that, let's see what examples I have. Um, yeah, maybe you realize that your narrative has a lot of cliches in it uh, and you want to move away from that. Uh, or you realize that, oh, that action, that is just like my childhood. Maybe I want to play more or less on that. So actually, meta-reflection is what we do when we steer our characters as well when we get that overview that allows us to choose a story we want to be part of. Yeah. So, um, what I also learned was that um, sometimes when we talk about like shifting between immersion, uh, immersion and other things, uh, there's this uh, separation between either being immersed or being out of the game. But actually, the meta-reflective state doesn't have to be out of the game. You see, you're still invested in the game, and also the reflections that you make uh, or the, the um, uh, connections that you take to your own life can actually make the game stronger for you uh, because it brings more of your engagement into it. So uh, that binary is not really um, real. Um, and it also shows that like, it's totally different rooms that you step into. Uh, if, you, if you play with meta techniques, for example, you might break the flow, but you are still playing. But if you have to say, stop, I'm really hurt, it's a totally different room, um, design-wise. Yeah. Um. Um, mm -mm. Yeah, or maybe you're just really bored and stuck in the frame of reality and really want to enter the story. That's something else than just really thinking about how does this LARP, uh, what does it have to do with me? Um, so I will do one last stretch of theory, and then we will go into more concrete examples. Okay? This is for the nerds. <laughs> 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 Yay! So um, in theater theory, people have tried to explain this with some really blunt words, uh, like aesthetic doubling. Um, to explain why we can learn so much from LARP uh, and theater and drama. Uh, but uh, they try to explain all the psychological and physical and phenomenological <coughs> and mental uh, states at the same time with this one word, uh, both as like, yeah, we will, yeah. <laughs> but as meta-reflection is conjugable, we can explain more directly what we try to say. So, uh, through this uh, system, we can understand role playing uh, having uh, a meta reflexivity in itself as an art form. That is, um, uh, that in any LARP, there's a meta reflexivity in its relation to reality and fiction, uh, that they are both present there. Uh, it's kind of a must for a LARP. Um, uh, every player will have their own meta-reflexive interpretive frame uh, where they can go to compare the LARP with the real world while they're playing. Um, and every, um, yeah. Uh, you can distinguish the activity to meta-reflect from a meta-reflection, a certain connection that you make. Uh, and, um, we can look at meta-reflexive methods, that is, design methods to facilitate meta-reflection in the uh, player group. And you can look at methods that are using the meta-reflexivity of role-playing, that is, the first point, to do other things uh, than to uh, facilitate meta-reflection. <coughs> and this is actually a lot of the uh, meta-techniques that we have. Because LARPing as an art form has certain constraints to it because it's physical and embodied. Uh, it's really hard to play a realistic LARP and continue to play on sex and violence and going to space uh, and these kinds of things. So then we need to, to solve that somehow and then we use the meta levels to do that usually. 
Um, it's also uh, all of the methods that are going into communication between player to player, calibration, safety techniques, are using the meta levels to do just that player to player communication. Yeah. Okay. So why uh, should we decide, design for meta reflection in our labs? Uh, since, as what we have covered so far, any player that can role play can meta reflect at their own chosen moments. So actually, no LARP needs this for the players to reflect. They can do that themselves as well. Um, and especially since it may break the flow if you put in uh, like certain breaks that now you should think, now you should feel. Um, why should we have? Um, why should we um, impose it? Uh, well, reflection is just a tiny part of it because really we can be really immersed in a LARP. Uh, even if we don't reflect during it, we can reflect a bunch before and after. So we don't really lose that even if we have the most escapist LARP. Um, but what we gain from having reflections during the LARP is that we can calibrate with them and bring these reflections into the LARP and change how we play together with them. So if you want uh, players to be able to calibrate more, it can be smart to have it. Uh, it also helps them to feel that, okay, this is my experience, I can steer it wherever I want. Um, yeah. It's, it may also be a way to train them in, uh, in cognitive skills, to switch around from different modes. Like, one moment I am feeling, the next I am thinking, uh, and that can be really good life, uh, life skills to have as well. Uh, but it also can be very taxing. Uh, because not everyone switches as easily as others. Some people prefer to uh, go deeply into one state and then switch to another for a long time. It's very individual how easily you uh, break your flow uh, and find it again. Um, and uh, yeah, and also human beings are not very good at doing two things at the same time, <laughs> even though we like to think it. So uh, most most LARPs uh, like. It's hard to be immersed and meta-reflective at the same time. Either you have to switch, you may li like to switch often uh, or for longer periods of time at a time, but usually you can't really be both a lot at the same time. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now we will go into uh, actual examples from LARPs where we have design uh, on how to play with these levels together uh, and not only in our own minds. So um, the explicit shifts are, of course, the most obvious ones. Um, the biggest shift that you can have in your LARP to get, get some room to think and, um, and contemplate are act breaks. They are, in a way, off game, but I have included them in the list because uh, in here you can calibrate for what you take into uh, the next act of the LARP. So it's still a reflection that you carry <coughs> with you. Uh, meta rooms and break rooms can do a bit of the same thing, uh, but act rooms have the uh, plus on them that they are uh, collaborative, so you can share them with others and calibrate together. Not necessarily everyone will be in the break room, so uh, that's a plus. Um, if we move down the scale, we can stop and rewind and change scenes. Uh, we can make do them again. Um, this is pretty used in forum theater. Uh, for example, where a theater form where you play out a scenario that ends badly and then let the audience come in and change it, uh, how it ended. Um, we don't do it so much in LARPs. I've seen some freeform scenarios do it, but I think it's uh, an aspect that we could use more, especially since there are not so many medias where it's so easy to just go back and change what we did and try it again. And that is also a really good place to try out different perspectives. What if we play it like this character saw it, or this character saw it, right? Uh, the smallest really explicit technique is uh, monologues. <coughs> and monologues per se might go into the uh, methods that are not really meta-reflective, but just using that level when it comes to sharing the inner life of the characters with each other. But you also have the more explicit meta-reflective one, which is called the player comment. It's quite rare to be seen, uh, but in the uh, when a destinist meet, uh, there's, uh, the, the director can actually ask the player to comment as themselves and not as their character on how the LARP is developing. Mm. 
Yes. We have more subtle shifts as well. Um, they do not break the flow of the game, uh, but it can still be a request to think about what you're doing. Um, mm -mm -mm. The, they are more common uh, because, probably, because they are softer and thereby easier to adapt for the player on what level they are comfortable with uh, changing and switch switching. But, of course, then they are not shared anymore uh, since you don't break the game uh, to do them. Um, integrated metacommunication is a complicated word to describe um, when you have emphasized or coded communication in the LARP that the players will understand, but it doesn't break the flow. Uh, safety words or escalation and uh, de-escalation words uh, is one of those kinds um, that, that uses this communication. But um, if we try to look at more um, that has more to do with the content of the LARP, I think we use it uh, too little, I think we can do it more. Um, especially like political theatre and feminist theatre uses a lot of uh, emphasis to show for example, how performative generals are. Uh, I think we could play with that, for example. Um, but some LARPs have it, uh, and I want to share those examples with you too. Uh, Anna Karin Linde ha has written two LARPs uh, with good examples. One is called A Monkey Just Like You, uh, and it's a LARP about teenagers, and uh, every time that someone says gets emotional or serious or says that's not funny, there's an uh, instruction that then the other ones has to respond by doing the monkey, that is being goofy. And when they have to respond with being goofy to that's not funny, it exposes a teenage dynamic uh, in a really direct way. Um, and like, yeah, so that you can then see it and describe it meaning, etc. In another of her LARPs, uh, Joachim, it's instructed that after, it's a LARP about bullying, and it's instructed uh, that if after every uh, monologue uh, where they are sharing their anxiety and angst over the situation, before they go back into pretending that everything is fine, everyone has to roar off laughter and then they go back. So that's also an emphasis on uh, the LARP's theme uh, that is uh, about upholding the facade collectively, right? Mm. You can also use sharp choices because they force you to think, where do I want the story to go next? Uh, or where have I been and what will, how will that affect this choice? Uh, this is uh, pretty common uh, yeah, as a narrative help. Um, in Innocence, for example, you have to choose if you are uh, going to give away your three symbols uh, at a certain moment. You're a clown who has run away from the circus. And if you do not give away all of your three their, their symbols, then you can never go back to the circus. So when at the, that, because that choice comes at the time limit, you have to think like, how do I want my LARP to end? This or this way? Um, yeah. It can also be more thematic, like in Just a Little Lovin', when you have to vote uh, on your chance of contracting AIDS, uh, you have to think about what did my character do this last act? Uh, how big are my chances? And you have to think realistically about that. Um, in another LARP, Have You Come Here to Play Jesus? Uh, you, uh, are, it's a LARP about euthanasia uh, within a family, so everyone is close to the person. And the LARP ends uh, with having to vote about if you think you should euthanize a family member or not. Uh, so then you have to take a stand uh, and, and like draw your character's uh, situation to a conclusion. Yeah. You can also have uh, internal meta reflection, uh, like processing moments. Um, this is like, if you think of a film, uh, you can have like landscape montages and things. Um, this, uh, this is usually done just by the players themselves, I think, that they just find a spot for when they want to take a step back. But you can also design it in. You can have an activity that they have to do, like write a letter or paint something, or that makes them think about where they are and process that. Uh, one of the more direct ways I've seen was uh, in uh, Do Androids Dream, where they built a city in a black box, 
Uh, and to make that feel like a city, you have to stay at the bus stop before moving between different areas. So you have to, after playing out one scene, maybe you needed to move someplace else. You would go there uh, and you had to wait for two minutes before moving on to your next scene. And you had instructions that then you should think about what do I want to do in the next scene and how. So you came really prepared. Um, yes. I would just, uh, I think I will skip this a bit. Um, yeah, you can also have a constant meta reflexive layer that makes, uh, that reminds you that you are playing and that you have la different layers of fiction and reality present um, instead of allowing you to focus on the fiction. Um, yeah. Mm. So uh, I will skip to the end now. Um, yeah, just some last advices. So these are some of the methods that we have, and I think we can uh, do a lot more. I think everyone has these, these levels available to them, so I think we can play more with them. But maybe it's not right for your LARP. Maybe some of these things are. Uh, as I said before, even the most immersive escapist LARP can bring you to totally new ways of living and being and seeing the world that can be really interesting. So you don't Sometimes uh, methods like this is right, sometimes not. Um, but what I want you to remember, regardless of how you do your LARPs, is that every LARPer will come with an individual lived experience through which they interpret the LARP. And they will come with an individual LARP experience because if we watch the movie, everyone watches the same story. But in a LARP, everyone will get a different story. So it's really hard to say that, oh, in this LARP, you should learn this thing. Because also, if you want them to learn one thing, maybe you should do something else than a LARP, uh, like write an article or something, because LARPs will be pluralistic. They will have a lot of different stories going on. They will have a lot of different frames of reference in every player. So it's really hard to pinpoint what connections will be meaningful for everyone. Yeah, uh, and also if you want, since they come with their own uh, knowledge base uh, you, and frames of reference, you might have to add the knowledge that you want them to take with them too. Um, the, the, the content of what you can learn in a LARP can be quite vast because all the participants may pour their lived experience into it, but what, what you can learn from a LARP is also what you put into it. So if the player's lived experience will not be enough, you have to design in how that knowledge comes. For example, Suffraget is a great LARP uh, example for this, where the players get to learn different uh, things about what feminists, uh, how the feminist movement was in the 1920s before playing. So by getting that really condensed and uh, exact information beforehand, everyone can use that knowledge in, to inform the LARP as well. And that LARP and uh, other political uh, LARPs I've I've seen like So You Think You Can Dance, which is about the Palestinian <coughs> situation, uh, usually uses uh, different players that are ambassadors for different worldviews. So uh, you had a feminist for, from different fractions, or you have Palestinian politicians from different fractions, and you as a player learn your part, and then you advocate for that, and then through the LARP you will meet all these different views, right? Um, and also, if, you, if it's sensitive that they get some things right, you might have to adjust it afterwards, because LARPs are also really sensitive because of this, to confirmation bias. Because we pour into our own knowledge into the LARP, and we play with that, and then we interpret that result with our own knowledge. So it can also just reinforce what we already know if you are not careful with uh, the subjects. Yeah. Uh, mm -mm. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I will finish off by asking you to trust the interpretive abilities of the participants. They are uh, capable of uh, drawing connections between their lives and the LARP and will look for having a, a good experience and will look for how uh, this LARP can be meaningful for them. Um, it's really uh, usually unsuccessful to try to force ideas or emotions. I know that it's really, uh, it's a common beginner's mistake to want to like change the world through 
uh, giving players this exact experience and now they have to feel. Uh, but that's kind of counterproductive because when we are um, force-fed an emotion, the most common response is distance, not empathy. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, what I would suggest is that you invite to exploration and interpretation. Because your LARP will, because it's participatory, have a lot of different meanings, it will be open. You can do a really a focused design, but uh, it will be a better LARP experience for everyone if it's open to different interpretations. Because that is what will happen anyway as well. So, um, trust your participants to uh, fill the LARP with meaning uh, and they will reward you for it as well. Thank you. <laughs>